Okay, so we're now at Exodus 25 to 30, and obviously I'm not going to read all of that. I hope you've had a chance to read over it. Um, gives you a good overview of the making of the tabernacle and all its furnishings and purposes. It's nearly exactly repeated again in chapters 35 to 40. Um, the only slight difference is that I think chapters 25 to 30 are giving the instructions to how it should be done. And chapter 35 to 40 is how they carried them out, um, the plan and the process, if you will. I'll touch on the significance of the tabernacle a little bit in this first section, but I mostly want to go over the details of the making of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and so on. Touch a little bit on the significance, but we'll spend more time on the significance in the later section of Exodus. So here we go. First, why was the tabernacle needed? Um, there are some answers that are given here. So chapter 25, verse 8 reads this. Then let them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among it. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. <clears throat> um, a couple of things to observe here. One is that it seems as though in some way the tabernacle is a, a pattern of what heaven is like. Um, and certainly it's the way for God to come up close and personal. When they left the land of slavery, they'd been guided in their wilderness wanderings by a pillar and a cloud, and they're about to settle in the land of promise. How will they know that God is among them? Well, um, not just through some random building, but actually this temple, this tent, that's a piece of heaven on earth. Uh, it's the pattern of how God can be approached in heaven. And actually, here at this point, it isn't a temple. It, it's, just, it's just a tent. It's very easily constructed, got a quite a lot of ornate furnishings within it, but it's movable. As they move, they take the tent with them. <clears throat> and actually, you remember the discussions uh, with King David, his desire to make a temple it seems was as much driven by them wanting to be like the other nations, to have some ornate grand place for their God to live in. And God says, no, I, <clears throat> I'll live in a tent, a simple structure where you can meet with me. And yet at the same time, he does concede and eventually says, well, yeah, it is, it is my heart that a temple can be built. Um, and actually Solomon then went on to build one even, even grander. But um, you can see the conundrum going on throughout these chapters uh, in the Old Testament. God should dwell in a simple structure, not in a very complex and ornate brick building. Second thing that's quite interesting is that, that some have envisaged the tabernacle as like a royal palace, you know, just like you would build something for the king to dwell in. And that's certainly how all the ancient Near Eastern cultures around them thought about these kind of structures. Others, and I think this probably ties in with lots of the themes we've seen already in Exodus, um, show a, a description of how God created the universe. And there's a bit of mirroring, I think, going on between the early chapters of the book of Genesis, using very similar language to the construction of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus. <clears throat> in these um, six chapters, we have the repeated phrase, the Lord said to Moses, and it's repeated seven times. And there are six creative acts in making the tabernacle, and then on the seventh, it climaxes in the celebration of the Sabbath, the act of rest. So you can see that it's quite intentional, it seems, that God is mirroring the creation of the tabernacle with the creation itself. The third preliminary thing to say about the tabernacle was that it was an extended visual aid, <clears throat> and very multi-sensory as well. So we're gonna note the sights, the sounds, the smells, the touch and the taste. Um, you know, the, that it wasn't only that they had the words of Moses, which were written down in the first five books of the Bible, but actually for the people, they had this very visible, um, visible structure that could remind them of how they could come close to God. The other thing that's finally to say by way of introduction is that there's the sort of certain symmetry to this. Um, so the size is a little bit hard to work out. A cubit was the length from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. Um, and 
So the size of the um, the size of the tabernacle was the size of probably a, a large living room. Think of a Wentworth uh, estate house with something um, that's more like the size of a coffee table um, as the size of the ark. Roughly, that's the proportions. So it wasn't a huge great palace, um, but that was roughly the size. But in, in that, there were three tons of silver, two and a half tons of um, bronze, and um, two tons of uh, three, and a ton of gold. Um, so, you know, an awful lot of precious metal being used to make this. So that gives you something of the picture of what the tabernacle was all about. It was a tent, not a building, um, an image perhaps of the royal palace, but perhaps more so of God in a recreative act, um, and then a very visual, symmetrical um, structure. How is the tabernacle constructed? And that's where we need to just quickly look over uh, chapter 25 and onwards. So there was the ark. Um, the ark was this sort of coffee table size um, piece of furniture. Um, it had a, the atonement cover on it of pure gold. And between the two cherubim, chapter 25, verse 22, um, was this, this sort of very grand place where God could be met. Um, so we don't actually know much more than that. I mean, the cherubim appear again in, in places like Isaiah's vision in Isaiah chapter 6, you know, the speak of God's holiness and his perfection but God's not represented in the cherubim um, actually that would that would break the first of the two commandments that we read about in Exodus 20 rather between the cherubim in this space God can be met um, the ark is treated with utmost reverence in 1 Samuel chapter 4 the Philistines capture the ark when they're very new in the land and the ark is returned to them um, in um, chapter 6 of, of 1 Samuel. You can read a bit more about the reverence that was held um, for the Ark in 2 Samuel chapter 6, but let me just read you a couple of verses from 1 Samuel 6 when the Ark was returned from the Philistines. So I should I mark this page and found it a bit quicker? This is 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 19. So the Philistines send back all these sort of gold um, icons, um, sort of guilt offerings back to the people. And the Lord struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, his holy God? To whom will the Ark go up from here? So, you know, there's a great sense of, of reverence at the Ark because it symbolised the holiness of God. Then there's the table, chapter 25, 23 to 30, and the table was something to put the food on. <laughs> Verse 30 says that every Sabbath day, 12 loaves of bread uh, were um, baked and put on the table. 25, 31 to uh, onwards, there's the lampstand, which is made of pure gold, and um, it's lit every evening by the priests. And again, more details in Leviticus 24 if you want to look that up. Then there is the tabernacle itself, um, chapter 26, uh, the curtains and the frames, uh, and preparing um, of the priests is actually much more innate than, than the building of the tabernacle itself. Um, but there is a sense in which you know, this is holy ground, that God meets with them in the simplicity of this structure. And then 27, 1 to 8, the altar for burnt offerings. And this happens in the outer court. You'll note that it's overlaid with gold and these, these horns. And this is sort of something that's stuck out from the side of the altar. Not exactly sure what it's about, but it seems to be something to do with redemption and sacrifice. I and mean, you can read about those who cling to the horns of the altar for refuge. But it's another reminder, too, that, that, that sin excludes the people from God's presence, but sacrifice opens up the way. And that's why the altar was so, so important. There's the courtyard, place of gathering, 27, 9 to 19. 27, 20 to 21, there's the 
oil for the lamp. And notice that, that little phrase in verse 21, the tent of meeting, that it's the place where human beings can meet in the presence of God. And then I mentioned the priestly garments, chapter 28, 1 to 43, which were quite ornate. And there's the ephod, which is kind of like an apron. There's the breastplate. There's a robe. Now, none of these things actually are to be replicated in the priesthood today, in my view. And the reformers are very clear about that. You'll notice that some of the ways in which the more Anglo-Catholic churches and the Roman Catholic churches, they do wear garments that look rather like priestly robes. But actually, the application of this dress wear is that they were worn by our great high priest, Jesus. Um, the symbolism here is that they need to get washed and dressed to come into the Lord's presence. Um, our access now, as the New Testament people of God, is via our high priest. We have no priest to mediate for us, but we have a high priest. Um, that's wrote, written about in amazing ways uh, in the New Testament. So if you look at Hebrews chapter two, for example, it talks about um, uh, that there's a, there's a more perfect priest in Jesus who takes us into God's very presence. Um, yeah, and he himself suffered in every way when he was tempted. So he's able to identify with those who are tempted, but actually able to provide a way out. And we'll come back to much more significance um, of Jesus' priestly role in Hebrews in due course. Chapter 30, verses 1 to 10, that the altar of incense, this was lit every morning. Now, again, nice little picture here, isn't there? So you had, they used to have the pillar of cloud by day and um, the pillar of fire by night. Now they have the altar of incense burning by day and the lighting of the um, menorah, the sevenfold lamp by night. Um, then chapter 30, um, all the way through the rest of the chapter, there's lots of smaller details on money and washing and oils and so on. So there's quite a lot to take in there. And we find it a little bit difficult to build a picture of that, but there are a few places, and I can point to these in your questions, where you can actually see some visual enactment about what the tabernacle and the ark would look like. Um, but let me give you three brief closing thoughts that might help you in your discussion. The first is to say that there are actually three parts to the tabernacle. There's the courtyard, the big sort of outer area, the size of the large living room um, sort of area, where, where everybody can come and gather. There's the holy place uh, where the Levites and the priests only can come. And then there's the most holy place where the high priest goes and makes the sacrifice for the sins of the people. Um, so there's a place for all, but there's a place where only the, the more excluded can go. Now, of course, all of that takes up much more significance when you turn again to Hebrews. We're going to be looking at Hebrews later in the year so we can dwell a bit more on some of the New Testament implications and applications. I to mark my pages in the Bible because it takes me too long to get to the chapter. But uh, this is a Hebrews 10 and verse 11 to 14. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to make, be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So our great high priest has made a once for all sacrifice to deal with sin once and for all. All that great language of Hebrews 10. And so one of the applications in Hebrews 10 verse 22 on a few verses, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Isn't that great? We know we can all come into the most holy place because of the work that our great high priest has done. And, you know, there's more we can say about that. Um, so that's the three parts of the tabernacle and how they apply. Let me just hone in on one little picture that we glossed over in chapter 29, 42 to 46. And that's really just the reminder that 
Secondly, that without holiness, no one can draw near to God. So um, look at the regulations that are given to the priest. Um, verse 42 of chapter 29. For the generations to come, this burnt offering is to be made regularly at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. There I will meet you and speak to you. There also I will meet with the Israelites and the place will be consecrated for my glory. So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I'll dwell among the Israelites and be their God. And they will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out from Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. It's a great emphasis on God's lordship and, and his holiness. And that um, we are invited to draw near, but actually we need consecrated priests to go in pure in our presence and to offer a sacrifice so that we can come in. Now, again, you know how great it is that Jesus fulfilled that role, but it's the reminder really of the importance of holiness. Be ye holy for I am holy, we've been saying, as we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Without that holiness, no one can draw near. And let me just touch very briefly on the big themes of Christ in the temple that I want to come back to in a few weeks' time. Um, so, you know, we read, didn't we, a few weeks ago that Jesus came among us, described as the word in John chapter one, and that uh, he, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He came close and brought that tabernacle literally to life in himself. And that means that because he's come as the perfect priest offering the perfect offering through the perfect tabernacle, the temple now is done away with. So all of the ritual of the temple, all the dress of the temple is no longer needed because we have direct access through his perfect sacrifice into the throne room of heaven. And when the language of temple is used in the New Testament, it speaks of his people. So there are twofold ways in which it's described. God dwells within his people by his Holy Spirit. So your body is a temple for the spirit, which speaks quite a lot about how we treat our bodies. God doesn't make junk. He expects our bodies to be you know, used well by him as his temple. And then the second picture in Romans chapter 12 is that we now offer living sacrifices. In other words, our bodies are used as the sacrifice to go out into this world um, to live and to serve to his honour and praise. So lots of really big themes here um, that speak about, you know, the picture of the tabernacle and drawing near, the need for holiness and the great full and final work that Jesus did on our behalf in drawing near so that we can draw near to God. Anyway, I hope that whets your appetite. Obviously, a lot more detail and all of that, and some of it we'll come back to shortly. But hopefully that will get you into your discussions uh, when you meet this week. Let me just pray. Father God, thank you for this amazing provision that you made for your people so that they could erect this tent and come into your presence through sacrifice and be drawn to you uh, as they're cleansed from their sin. And thank you, Lord, how much more that applies to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who offered a sacrifice once and for all, so that we may come into the Holy of Holies. Lord, help us to draw near with confidence, with the full assurance of forgiveness, so that we might be your um, temple in this world, serving you faithfully and to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.